Hello again. My name is Negan Mariahi. I'm from the University of South Australia, and I have the wonderful privilege to moderate the panel discussion that will be happening today on the very interesting topic of self-regulated learning and the use of e-portfolios in education. Thank you to everyone uh, for coming and joining us today and to our panelists. I will now introduce each of the panelists and they, the way the setup will be is that in turn, they will introduce themselves and give a short description discussion around their particular expertise around the use of self-regulated learning and e-portfolios. After which um, I will ask a few questions, um, one of each panelist, and then open up to any questions that the audience members have for our panel today. So to begin, as I mentioned, my name is Negan Mariahi. I'm from the University of South Australia. I, I would like to welcome you to the panel. Um, we have today Professor Gavin Brown, who's the Director of Quantitative Data Analysis and a Research Unit at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. We also have Associate Professor Christine, who's an Enterprise Fellow uh, with us at University of South Australia in the academic unit called Education Futures. And we also have Dr. Florence Gabriel, an Enterprise Fellow in Education Futures and also a Senior Research Fellow in the Center for Change and Complexity in Learning at the University of South Australia. Now, Chris will be starting today's uh, webinar. So I'm going to hand it over to Chris to share his slides and to give us about 10 minutes of um, his background in software cloud learning and e-portfolios. So I'll hand it over to Chris. Thank you, Megan. And uh, I'll start by acknowledging that although we are meeting virtually um, the land that we are on, is the traditional lands of the Ghana people, and we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. And we also pay respects to the cultural authority of Aboriginal people visiting or attending from other areas of South Australia, and of course, worldwide as well. And so let me start by pulling up my very brief, I swear, PowerPoint. Hopefully you can see that. And uh, the idea is I can tell you a little bit that I've been doing e-portfolio uh, research and practice for over a decade, rather than simply tell you about me or what I do, which frankly is a rather boring topic, in my opinion. Instead, I'm going to use what I've done to tell you about what I think we need to be focused on with e-portfolios and three propositions for the future. So I'll start, though, with a definition. And this is a definition I've come to over time that e-portfolios are deliberate, they're curated collections of work, and they're meant to provide opportunities for developing, demonstrating, and narrating complex outcome achievement. Now, that's fairly complex stuff, so let me try and break that down a little bit. Here's what I mean by these different parts. When I talk about deliberate and curated, I mean that it's the student who determines what goes into the e-portfolio according to a systematic and hopefully reflective process. And it's guided by intentions. I'll say some more about intentions later because they feature prominently. It's also, of course, the collection of work itself. So these are the artifacts, the things that go into the e-portfolio. Often, it's also an explanation of the e-portfolio's representative value. And, of course, the actual act of arrangement results in particular types of collection. And then we have the more active elements, uh, development, demonstration, narration. E-portfolios are dynamic. Uh, they're summative and they're formative, meaning that they're meant to both demonstrate achievement, but then also help students progress towards achievement. And so these three characteristics are really about all the activity and the bustle around the work that's done, the arrangement, the dialogues with peers and experts, and that narration of values. But as with many things, it comes down to the outcomes. All of these things have to wrap around a core. And I would argue that that core should be a broad but clear framework of intention. And these can be, for example, a recognized system of self-regulated learning, how we define it. It can be program-intended learning outcomes, graduate competencies. I'm less fussed about what the framework of intention is. And I am very concerned, though, that one exists and that a clear dynamic relationship is established. 
so e-portfolios, they're meant to function a bit like a nice cup of tea. They are to be stimulating. They are to be refreshing. They are something to be savored and perhaps even not only good for the mind, but for the spirit, for the soul. Certainly, when we hear people talk about e-portfolios, they're good for us. A lot of the language, uh, it, it reminds me of kind of a commercial for expensive tea. Uh, but there are some very specific things that we should be paying attention to. The opportunity for e-portfolios to expand and connect assessment and learning possibilities, it's absolutely there. It's real. Uh, also, a common and current issue is how are we going to design resilient assessment and learning systems against uh, artificial intelligence or perhaps even leveraging it? And of course, addressing ongoing academic integrity issues. E-portfolios are enjoying a resurgent interest as positioned to address those kind of modern university issues. And of course, promoting self-regulated learning and helping us to develop our students into self-regulated learners. And the most cutting edge work that I know is a piece that just came out by Rola Ajawe and David Baud uh, on how portfolios potentially can bridge our understanding and how we narrate student success with how the larger workforce understands it and the people who we want to hire our students, because we don't always speak the same language of the, as them. Any portfolios may help as a bit of a Rosetta Stone. That's the promise. But are we getting a nice cup of tea or are we getting a bitter brew? Well, if we look at a lot of what the good research on ePortfolio tells us, we see a lot of limited adoption, facile responses, rapid abandonment. And this isn't just research-based. I think a lot of us have been at or are at institutions that have tried their hand at ePortfolios. We did in 2014 an analysis of two programs, both of them in professional degree programs, one in the Netherlands, uh, one in the US. The one in the Netherlands was flourishing. It was doing very well. Uh, it functioned adroitly as both a learning and assessment experience. By contrast, the one in the United States was a failing capstone project. Uh, they had had to step back from using it as a capstone assessment to something that one of the interviewees described as a very rudimentary victory lap. So are we getting good tea or are we getting a bitter brew? Well, I would argue the real problem is we don't know. Because if we don't know how to make the T, and in this case, I'm using T as both a metaphor, but an acronym, technology enhanced assessment. That's what ePortfolios are meant to be. If we don't know how to make technology enhanced assessment work, then we might get either. But the likely outcome, if we don't understand, is we get something we really don't find very palatable. So what's holding us back then? Why aren't we seeing the why aren't we seeing the success match the enthusiasm? Well, let me give one answer that I typically give and I have for the entire duration of the time I've been doing ePortfolio research. This is the anime. They carry pom-poms. Be afraid. Cheerleading. The idea that ePortfolio rhetoric is unrepentant evangelizing. A lot of it is technology evangelizing. Some of it is teaching, learning, and assessment evangelizing. But it's the idea that there is an uncritical acceptance and push for ePortfolios to be good and to mean something, regardless of whether they do or they don't. Unsurprisingly, this bleeds into research. And I always go back to a 2006 study by Ayala. She found out of 300 published articles on ePortfolios, less than 5% adopted what we might call a critical perspective. I don't necessarily mean empirical research here. I mean any kind of research or literature that steps back to first order questions like, do ePortfolios work here? If yes, why? If not, why not? But it's been 17 years. Has it improved? Well, uh, in a forthcoming piece by me, Tracy Ryan, and Mike Prosser, what we found is, yes, we now see a bit more. The percentage has nudged up, but not nearly as much as we might want. It remains a disproportionately uncritical area of the literature around ePortfolios, that is, 
and this results in limited replicatability and scalability. And rarely do they link to these frameworks of intention that are so important for rationalizing why we might use an e-portfolio in the first place. Unsurprisingly, this links to problems in practice, one of which is the idea that when we have e-portfolio initiatives, they're often led by the ed tech people or they're captured dialogically by the ed tech folks. Of course, we want the ed tech folks in there. But when we get into the more sophisticated elements of epistemic and ontological understanding and where that fits within particular disciplinary variation, that's where we need other stakeholders. And we're not often seeing that. There's also our failure to account for the complexity of change management. Making good changes stick, that's hard business. And if you're talking about assessment change, it is a multiplier of difficulty greater. And that's not just about e-portfolios. So if research is to inform practice, we have to do two things. First, we have to be honest and we have to be clear about the issues on both sides. Cheerleading doesn't help get us there. In fact, it may hinder that. And also we then have to address those issues. So let me offer three ideas for doing just that. Proposition one, fairly self-evident, we need better research and we need better practice. So replicatability and scalability to me are great ways to begin to think about this. And again, I'm not necessarily hung up on the empirical research element, although I certainly value that. But there's plenty of empirical research out there that's so small scale and so context driven that it doesn't meet the threshold of replicatability and scalability. Conversely, I've read some great theory papers that have led to some real launching off points, but we need the launching off points. We also need leadership and management in higher education that embraces complexity rather than attempts to bulldoze or over it. And of course, we need stakeholder engagement. Everyone who's concerned with e-portfolios, including the students, should have a voice. Second, make those links. First, between research and practice, which I think we're going to be talking about more today and certainly evidencing, but also between those e-portfolios and frameworks of intention, like self-regulated learning. And then finally, we need to make value explicit. You know, when we're hip deep in something, sometimes we forget other people may not see the nature of what it is we're doing or even the value of what we're doing. It's good for us, it's just not good enough. So what should we be doing? Well. First, I think we need to talk about how e-portfolios do or don't meet universities' modern assessment needs. We need to be talking about e-portfolios and researching them in relationship to things like AI, contract cheating. This is a great drive for both research and practice. But also, to be blunt, um, can it help students get a job and then perhaps a better job? Uh, it's this idea that e-portfolios have to serve functions that are highly pragmatic to the principal stakeholders we're trying to engage, our students. But not just employment, life-wide too. E-portfolios should promote better citizenship, uh, lifelong competencies. The potential to do so is there. We need to actuate that potential. But the third one of the third, I will leave open. And instead, I will invite all of us who are here today to consider, well, what else do we want out of e-portfolios? Who else do we want to engage? My fellow panelists are going to be talking a little bit about that, but I hope all of you will join me too in reflecting on this, not just during the session, but after, so that we can take away something that might actually advance our understanding and our practice. So with that, I'll say thank you very much, and I will hand it the other panelists. Thanks, Chris. You've certainly left us thinking about what we can do in this space, and um, you provide a good historical overview of 17 years of research and practice in ePortfolios. Now going to turn over to Gavin, uh, who's going to give us his share of ePortfolio research, what he's done. Tenakoto Katoa, I bring you greetings from Waipapa Taumata Rao, which is the Maori name for the University of Auckland from Nazi Fatsua. Um, my perspective on e-portfolios has always been simple. That's a great, cool idea. How will you assess it? It's the only question I ever ask, and I never seem to get an answer. So this is my take on 
the issue. ePortfolio is meant to be a data collection device and all the things Chris mentioned, and it, it has to be evaluated. Otherwise, why would anyone bother? They're evaluated for entry into uh, professions like nursing and teaching, uh, or they're judged for entry like a artist portfolio. Can I get into the arts, fine arts academy? Or at the end, when I want to get a job and I show you a portfolio of drawings or art I've done or pictures I've taken, and even models have portfolios. So they exist in the real world and they are judged. Now, clearly, getting your portfolio ready to be judged requires you to exercise considerable control over your learning and thinking processes in terms of preparing and selecting the contents believing that the evaluation that's going to be made of it is legitimate and may actually help you improve your portfolio. And believing that when somebody says, I don't like this, or what did you mean by that, or gives you any other comment on your portfolio, that it actually might help you rather than just damn you. So certain beliefs are necessary. So in terms of ordinary assessment. Let's step aside from e-portfolios. You can see here a number of citations that I've done research into how students' beliefs about assessment and feedback links to performance or assessed performance. So I want to just highlight here in this complex diagram, on the left are a series of beliefs that the students answered at university about the nature of feedback. And you can see three of the bottom three actually have some connection to other things. So if I believe that peers help me, their feedback helps me, it increases my self-regulated learning scores. If I actively use feedback and enjoy getting it, that really helps my self-regulated learning. And my self-regulated learning is correlated with my self-efficacy. I can do what you're asking me to do. Interestingly, in terms of how it helped their overall term GPA, self-efficacy mattered, actively using feedback and enjoying getting that feedback contributed a lot to GPA, but believing in peers and trusting your tutors and markers alone did not, in fact, made your GPA worse, which is an interesting phenomenon to try to explain, but it certainly says Students who take responsibility for their learning and embrace feedback on a growth-oriented pathway perform better. Now, ePortfolio technology is seen as the modern re requirement to deal with paper. If you, I was a high school English teacher, and we used to have these folders, and after about six weeks, those folders got ignored, and no one put anything in them anyway. And so there's a whole bunch of technological systems that have to be thought about and put in place. And there are many different portfolio systems. And I'm not a, I don't advocate any single one of them. I think it all depends on who the instructor is and what your goal is. But the thing I always care about is the, how does it help us do assessment and evaluation? And it turns out that when students have a positive attitude towards using e-portfolio technology, regardless of what it what is, it seems to support certain positive views about of assessment. That I'm using this e-portfolio because your teacher's using it to improve teaching, and I'm going to use it to improve my learning. And it helps us cooperate and have a more positive classroom climate. But interestingly, what we found in this Hong Kong study is that the intention to use the e-portfolio technology, which was a requirement of the course they were in, contributed to GPA. I'm going to be judged on this. I better use it. And if I ignore the assess component, it makes my performance worse. So clearly, as long as e-portfolios and the technology related to it are going to be judged and contribute to a summative grade of some sort, it matters. 
My student, Dr. David San Jose, did a couple of studies on the e-portfolio systems that are being used at uh, the University of Auckland. And what we found is it didn't really matter which system that you were using. The technology infrastructure was pretty much the same, and some liked X and some liked Y. But what really came out of it was there was no support in the e-portfolio systems for assessment processes like circulating my submission to someone else and getting some feedback from the instructor or even getting an automated evaluation of my contribution against a rubric. Nothing happened. So as far as I'm concerned, the problem is that the ed tech people don't understand assessment. They might understand data. They might understand manipulation of artifacts, but they don't understand. And I'm looking for an e-portfolio technology that will automatically map new submissions to some sort of rubric or even previously scored submissions as a comparison to say, we think this is high, middle, low, close to or above or below. I would like automated linking of submissions to appear in the same class that says these three people have submitted something on the same topic or in the same way. Please, which one would you like us to send it to for their comment? Clearly, some work will be below standard or even suspect being automatically copied or duplicated from somewhere else. Why can't we have technologies in an e-portfolio that flag these suspect or low quality to the tutor instructor so the human can intervene with the learner? And where are those automatic consistency checks where the tutor says, I think this is pretty good, and we can compare that to what the peer said or what the self said? Clearly, ed tech people in e-portfolios don't understand assessment, and that's what's failing us. Thank you, Gavin. And for leaving us on that note, and I do see there's a, a message in the chat for you to follow up on that. So maybe you would be able to create that one day with some links with industry. So um, we're now going to turn over to Florence, who's going to talk a little bit about um, more of the connection between self-regulated learning and e-portfolios. So over to you, Florence. Thank you, Negan. Uh, let me just share my slides. Can you see my slides? No, we cannot. We can't. Uh, okay. Um, yes, go for it. All good? Wonderful. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Um, my name is Florence Gabriel. I'm, I'm a learning scientist. I come from an educational neuroscience and a policy background as well. So I'm going to talk more about self-regulated learning um, in this short presentation. Um, so I'll start this presentation by looking at the, the bigger picture. And I'll talk about some of the skills that will be needed for the future. And this is this has been a topic of focus in international and national policies in recent years. So trends such as globalization or more recently advances in artificial intelligence, they have been ch changing the demands of the labor market and also the skills that workers will need to succeed. So people will need to rely even more on their uniquely human capacity for creativity, for critical thinking, and also their ability to learn how to learn. And um, this is something that is described in the OECD. Sorry, my cat is meowing in the background. I hope that's not too distracting. <laughs> um, this is something that is described in the OECD 2030 uh, learning compass as uh, shown on the screen here. And this is a learning framework, um, which I actually helped develop when I was working for the OECD. Um, it highlights the importance of student agency. And student agency refers to the ability of students to take an active role in their own learning and have a sense of control and ownership over their learning process. And student agency is closely linked to um, the concept of self-regulated learning. Now the UN have their um, sustainable development goals, and these highlight the importance of quality education, which promote 
which promotes lifelong learning opportunities for all. So according to the UN, lifelong education for can help create a more equitable society, harness cultural diversity, um, enhance well-being, and also ensure sustainable development and prosperity. And here again, we can see um, the emphasis on lifelong learning. Um, at a national level, here in Australia, a car so the Australian Curriculum Authority developed something called work studies in the Australian curriculum. So that's something for students in, year, uh, in years nine and 10. And this was developed in response to key work-related issues that young people are facing today and also will face in the future. And this aspect of the Australian curriculum aims to ensure that students develop knowledge of the world of work, but also knowledge about the importance of lifelong learning. And you see that learning to learn is highlighted on this slide, and that can also be translated to learning strategies. And here again, they're widely seen as a, a key competency for lifelong learning. And they are emphasized as a goal for education, not, not just in Australia, but also in many countries around the world. So learning how to learn is a, a process that can be supported by self-regulated learning. And there are many, many, many different models of uh, SRL in the research literature. But as you can see on this slide, it can be summarized as, a, as an active cyclical process where students will plan, monitor, review, and then regulate their cognition, their metacognition, their motivation, and their emotions. So there are, there are three main common phases that are used in SRL models. So planning, managing, and reviewing. And in each of these phases, you have different strategies and processes taking place. So you have cognitive strategies, and that can include um, summarizing, note-taking, rehearsal, elaboration, and all of these help with uh, memorization. Then you also have metacognition. And metacognition is often, often described as thinking about thinking. And it's been shown to be a, a strong predictor of academic achievement. Uh, but what's important to note here in, in learning settings is that it's hard to change your thinking if you're not aware of your thinking. All right, so instead of describing metacognition as thinking about your thinking, you can think about it as an awareness of your learning or taking control of your learning. Now, the research literature also highlights the importance of motivational and emotional processes. And these processes are both critical for successful learning because they drive initial engagement and then perseverance and then ultimately performance on learning tasks. Um, positive emotions, so that can be things um, such as enjoyment or hope or pride, they will promote motivation and they will enable students to control their engagement with a learning task and ultimately enhance their, enhancing their commitment to achieving their learning goals. Um, so self-regulated learning is a very important predictor of students' academic achievement, um, their employability, and also career progression. Uh, some of you may have heard about the Teaching and Learning Toolkit. So it's a, a toolkit that was developed by the Education Endowment Foundation in the UK. And we have the equivalent here in Australia, it's called Evidence for Learning. And this toolkit is based on systematic reviews and meta-analyses of data from around the world. And if we look at this figure here, we can see that metacognition and self-regulation have the highest impact on students' learning. So metacognition and self-regulation approaches, they have consistently high levels of impact, with students making an average of seven months additional progress. So that means that metacognition and self-regulated learning, they add seven months of progress within 12 months of schooling. And that's progress measured in terms of standardized test results. And there's also lots of evidence in the research literature supporting the importance of metacognition and self-regulated learning. And that's indicated by the number of padlocks you can see on the screen. And here we're talking about primary and secondary levels, uh, but it, it also translates to higher education. And we know that from research studies that um, the impact of approaches focusing on SRL is high, and that works really well in the lab. 
but it can actually be very tricky to achieve this in practice because it requires students to take greater responsibility for their learning and also develop their understanding of what is required to succeed. So what are the relationships between ePortfolios and SRL? Well, ePortfolios, it can be a very valuable tool for students to develop their SRL skills uh, with things such as goal setting, monitoring, and strategy use. Um, ePortfolios, they offer flexibility, dynamic reflection, and also student choice. And all of that can enable um, students to visualize their growth and their development. On top of that, ePortfolios provide students with a range of options to document their strategies and reflections. And that will support uh, metacognitive strategies such as journaling or um, video and audio recordings or um, narrated whiteboard presentations. And they can also facilitate collaboration between students and educators and between students themselves, so leading to increased engagement and motivation. And here's a, an interesting framework that I want to share with you, um, because I think it highlights some of the similarities between SRL and how ePortfolios can be used. So the ATS 2020 learning models that you can see here on, on this slide, it was tested on about 10,000 uh, European high school students, and it takes on a very student-centered approach, uh, also focuses on, on digital tools. And the model shows the learning cycle, starting um, with the student checking their prior learning and then setting goals, and then ending with self-evaluation and setting new goals for the next learning cycle. And all of this is very similar to the SRL models I mentioned earlier. Obviously, feedback and assessment play an important role in this model. And in each phase, the, the teacher or the lecturer can act as a learning coach using formative assessment and feedback to, to help students on their learning journey, but also to improve their artifacts and, and gain a deeper understanding and reaching their learning goals. So according to this learning model, ePortfolios can be used as a pedagogical tool to scaffold and support students' learning by developing their SRL skills. And, and there is evidence from research showing that ePortfolios can support the development of self-regulated learning. That's something that um, Gavin mentioned earlier. And, and they do indeed provide a, a relevant environment for practicing SRL skills. Um, they can assist students in monitoring and evaluating their learning behaviors by causing them to, to reflect on their learning process. And that's particularly the case when ePortfolios are used as assessments for learning instead of or, or in addition to assessment of learning. Um, so, for example, results from the 2012 Welsh study, they support the idea that ePortfolios aimed at facilitating the development of SRL should be designed to do so. So the ePortfolio she used in her study was only partially successful in facilita facilitating students' development of SRL skills. And this is because the portfolio was missing some important features. Um, so it's missing things such as allowing students to set their own learning goals or move at their own pace. So you really need strong pedagogical intent when using ePortfolios to support SRL. Right, so my final point, if, even if some studies seem to indicate that ePortfolios can be a helpful tool for developing SRL skills um, and that they result in higher performance, we still don't have a clear picture of exactly which elements or which learning behaviors promote positive outcomes. And on top of that research, looking at relationships between ePortfolios and SRL, they present a bunch of methodological issues. So th there's still much we don't know. And some of the research we are conducting or planning to conduct at c 3 and also with, with Gavin, uh, um, intend to explore this relationship further. So to conclude, um, I think that there is a promising future for using ePortfolios to enhance the development of self-regulated learning skills, but their complete potential has not been fully realized yet. Thank you. Thanks, Flo. So before I turn it over to the audience to see if there's any questions, um, 
I've been taking rigorous notes on, on each of the panelists as they were giving their talk. And I was going to pose a question for each of the panelists to consider. So I might just um, pose a question to Flo just on the back of what you were sharing with us, Flo, around the notion of lifelong learning and e-portfolios being something that can support that, but also how you were talking about metacognition as an element of self-regulated learning and really about that awareness of learning and the skills around um, learning goals and learning strategies and how the use of an e-portfolio can help students develop these skills. So on the back of that, um, for students to be successful in creating their e-portfolio, which could be evaluated, which is what Gavin was talking about just before you, how do we as educators help students develop those skills, whether it's a reflective skill, for example, or that ability to be able to be aware of their learning? How do we develop those skills so that they can ultimately be successful in the creation of that e-portfolio? Uh, yes, so the, you're absolutely right. So when it comes to curating e-portfolios, reflective practice and metacognitive awareness are just as important as the curation of artifacts. So th these self-regulated learning skills can be developed by undergraduate students with the right strategies. Um, so for example, educators can provide guidance on reflective writing. Um, it's, it's really an essential element of um, e-portfolio creation. Um, students should be able to reflect on their learning experiences and connect them to specific learning outcomes, but also identify areas for improvement. Uh, another strategy uh, would be to encourage peer feedback. Uh, peer feedback can be a, a valuable tool for promoting metacognitive awareness and um, reflective practice. Uh, another thing that can be used is um, for educators to provide opportunities for revision. Um, revision is an important aspect of self-regulated learning. So if we allow students to revise their e-portfolios based on, on feedback and self-reflection, -re then they can develop a better and a deeper understanding of their own learning and then eventually improve the quality of their work. Um, another thing that was mentioned, I think, earlier, uh, which I think is a very important strategy, is to scaffold the process. Uh, we know that creating your e-portfolio can be a, a very complex task, so students may need support to, to develop the, the skills they need here. Um, and, and lecturers or tutors, they can scaffold that process by breaking it down into smaller steps. Um, but also by providing clear guidelines and clear expectations, and obviously by providing feedback and, and support throughout the process. So I think these strategies can really help students develop uh, the, the SRL skills that they will need. Thanks, Flo. Um, and certainly developing um, any portfolio is a, a daunt, it can be a daunting task for and, students. Can I comment on that? Yes, please? of course. Yes, go for it, Gavin. Flo, that's I, I mean, I totally buy that. The problem is humans are really crappy judges of their own abilities and that of their peers. Uh, all you have to do is look at any professor's marking of essays over time, and you will see total chaos in the reality and realism. So I think one of the things that's really missing out of all of this positive talk is how do we teach young people even before they get to school, how to be honest, how to be realistic. Yeah, I enjoy this game, but I'm not very good at it, but I am getting better. Those kinds of honesty have to be encouraged, scaffolded, and developed from preschool to university. Otherwise, they're going to go, oh, why didn't I get a B? I worked really hard on this. I was up till 2 a.m. You owe me a B. I need that for my scholarship. You know, Students do that to us and to themselves, so we need to help them become realistic. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in too and say um, being honest is a lot easier in high trust environments mm -hmm. and where the stakes are cumulative or progressive. And so if we talk about what is within the domain that we can affect within the higher education sector, I think we can look to examples where 
students' initial engagements with the e-portfolios are frequent, low stakes, dialogic, um, you know, the idea of revision and the cyclical process. But at the same time, that whole cyclical process isn't just about getting better work product. It is about sharpening their self-evaluative capacity and the accuracy of that capacity. It is about helping them think through at a metacognitive level the superstructure around the learning. So I think insofar as we can affect it, we need to evolve structures around e-portfolio and self-regulated learning that actually embrace low stakes, sustained engagements with our students over time. And welcome to the tragedy of the 12-week semester course. Perhaps we need to be programmatic e-portfolios. I've just noticed that one of our attendees has raised their hand. So um, I might just, just turn it to Zijun. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. My apologies. Um, I'm not sure if you're able to ask your question um, or make your comment through audio through this webinar system. If you can, please do so. If not, you can type your question or comment in the chat for the panel. There is a question in the chat, Q&A. Yeah, there's, there's a question too. Um, maybe. Ah, uh, yes. Maybe that person can type Daniel. it in. That's Daniel, yep. So Daniel, Daniel does have a question in, in, in the chat, Q&A. All right. Um, well, let, let's turn to Daniel's while we wait for the next one. Um, and there's two from him there. So does any of the research distinguish between STEM or hard sciences, which feature largely objective criteria, versus humanities or social sciences, which feature more subjective criteria? I'm not sure. Um, about that objective subjective criteria um, and is there any breakout in this research in relation to age or grade mm -hmm. level? Right so I, I can say a little bit about this. Um, one of the things to consider is uh, I, what, what blew me away in the more recent stuff I've been doing around ePortfolios is how deeply embedded and successful they are in STEM and medicine. Uh, sometimes we include medicine, sometimes not, but I always do. Uh, and I think part of the reason is the idea of inducting people into appropriate diagnostic procedures that invariably engage self-regulated learning. And so it's weird because you would expect these to be far more deeply embedded successfully in humanities, social science, <laughs> and certainly within art uh, and architecture. Sure, of course, these predate the E in the e-portfolio. Mm -hmm. But it's been absolutely fascinating to me, Dan, to see how uh, medical people have taken to e-portfolio use like a duck to water. Um, so while we talk about objective criteria, oftentimes while the criteria are objective and high stakes, they're also highly situational and they require individuals to think diagnostically and quickly under pressure. And so perhaps that's part of the reason why, in fact, we see um, STEM seems to be taking to ePortfolio. Hmm. No, Can I say that Sorry. in in the studio arts, there is a long tradition of judging quality by observation. And what happens is, at least here in New Zealand, school teachers in uh, one school share their art portfolios with other teachers in other schools thus creating a community of common understanding of what quality is. And so then when the New Zealand Qualifications Authority has done an internal study to compare teacher marks in the field with expert marks in the center, the highest correlation between teacher marks and center expert marks was in studio arts because they have a common understanding of what quality is. And that's really the goal of judging performance, joining a community that knows how to judge quality. So on that note then, um, when we're thinking about 
the portfolios and, and they're used in teaching quite widely as well uh, as well as a social science. Um, students don't want to do them sometimes. You often hear, oh, another e-portfolio. And part of that is often in relation to the reflective component in e-portfolios. So it's one thing where you're curating the work that you've done and you're compiling it into a portfolio that you could present to a future employer. And I know that work um, connection um, was made earlier when Chris was um, giving his presentation. But what do we do when we know it's so-called good for them um, and employers perhaps look at it and certain employers certainly do when employing the right individual? There's a creation aspect, but I like to get back into that reflective aspect and how students often say, oh, another reflection, or they find reflection difficult. And that is a skill, again, you know, that students need to build to be the successful, not only lifelong learner. So what do we say to that? And how do we help our instructors help our students overcome that, which then gets back to what Chris was originally saying in his around, bit of a lack of adoption of e-portfolios, or they use it and then they give up on it because it is so hard to get sometimes students over that hump of yeah. recognizing how valuable it is to them. Are, are you asking anyone in particular? Or? Yeah, go for it, anyone at all. On the panel. So I'll say that this was absolutely coming out of some of the research um, that I've done. And I've done with Gavin um, a few years back. Uh, Gavin and David Carlos and I um, had a successful general research funds grant in Hong Kong. And uh, that's what the 2018 article came out of. And one of the findings that we had uh, were over and over in the interviews, the students were saying, I hate this. I don't see the point. I just, just, just give me a test. I want to be done with it. And of course, if you're positioning e-portfolios strictly as hurdle requirement assessments, in other words, if you shove it entirely into the summative process, then it's really hard to make the case to students. So you actually have to back it up. You, you can't just talk the talk. You have to walk the walk. Um, one of the things, and I'll kind of take a sidestep and say what we could be doing, uh, because I don't have too many examples of people who are successful uh, yeah. outside of highly contextual scenarios, like, um, you know, the Hoche School in Amsterdam, um, you know, in Milwaukee, there's Alverno. They're highly successful programs, but it's baked into the culture. And so students go there and they're like, oh, it's part of the culture. And so it's, it's set within the broader expectations. But something that we could be doing that I've actually worked when it comes to uh, just general program academic expectations, pull in recent graduates who are actually still using their portfolios and are using them to leverage success in ways that the students will understand. So don't try as the person with the corduroy jacket and the elbow patches and the gray in their beard to try and tell these students, yeah, no, you really need to be doing this. Pull in somebody that they relate to, somebody they see an immediate connection to. They want to be this person in two years, three years, four years. Have them come in and say, look, it's worth your time. Here's why. Here's how you're going to keep using it. And of course, if you can't find those people, ooh, well, maybe you're not doing e-portfolios right. Can I say that one of the things that I've seen in the studio arts is having a clear rationale. Sure, this portfolio is going to be judged whether you get AP, studio art pass, or enter to the degree you want. But they have a clear sense of what is it valuable in being an artist. You have to show breadth, you have to show depth, and you have to show development. So when you start with these are the fundamental dimensions that you have to exhibit in this discipline, then it becomes much easier to sell it because they know that they're acquiring the fundamental skills and knowledge and capabilities that belong to the discipline. So an engineer's e-portfolio should look different to a studio art, but maybe they should all show breadth, depth, and development. There's a great question from Jane in the chat in regards to how AI could potentially be used to help judge, give feedback um, on e-portfolios. Um, 
I'll let you look at that question, panelists, but I'm going to actually let Zijuan, uh, I'm going to allow Zijuan to, to talk and maybe get the, the question um, from the individual. So I'll click on the allow to talk button and let's see, go ahead, Zijuan, see if you can maybe unmute and ask the panelists your question. Hello. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, sorry, I just didn't uh, follow you for the last time you asked me. Actually, I'm working in a university, and I think the ePortfolio is a good thing for the student uh, to evaluate their uh, abilities. And uh, I want to do this, but I found when go to a, a, a special program, how to make the criteria for the uh, just like a big tree, to make a big tree to uh, uh, put the things uh, on the tree, just like the leaves. I think it's a very big problem. So for me, it is hard to, to do this to, uh, from the day work, because we, we are thinking about uh, this is a big day time, and uh, I want to use the data uh, for the learning process and to evaluate the ability from the, uh, the first year to the fourth year uh, to use the portfolios. And uh, I found when I want to do this, I've, I want to fix the, that problem first. So I think it's a big challenge to do this. I'm, I'm from China and uh, Actually, we didn't have very good examples uh, for the uh, from the education system to use the e-portfolio. But when I study in the Aspasca University, uh, they are online, online universities, and they make the uh, ask a student to do e-portfolio and to uh, um, uh, just like it's a, how, how do you say that? It's a competition for the student to. Uh, share the e portfolios and the, to evaluate themselves. So I think this is a, a is a problem. Pardon me for me to how to make the e portfolio more uh, useful and uh, can su support the students' learning and uh, to help them evaluate themselves. So uh, for for the professors, do you have some experience like this to help me? Thank you. Um, the first thing that strikes me is um, these are kind of a lot of different issues uh, that seem to be coming across at program level, but also the interaction with the students. Um, I think, I think the, I don't, I don't have any answers that would be directly here, do this, do that, do that. But what I would say is what you've already found is that by engaging with universities that may have successful programs, you've begun to get a sense of directions. And so some potential next steps would be to identify partner institutions that might be willing to do some exchange work with you, even if it's just knowledge exchange, uh, to help understand the situation because e-portfolios are very contextually driven. And so even though I think you provided us a very rich sense of the context in which you're operating, I think that's the kind of thing that a repeated set of engagements with a set of people who are running successful programs, that, that would be my suggestion for what a good next step might be. Yeah, it, I mean, there's no doubt that modern machine learning, learning analytic, artificial intelligence, which is all just algorithms, there's no intelligence and there's no artificial. It's just humans programming code and formulas. That All of these things lend themselves to analyzing the kinds of data that could be embedded inside an electronic portfolio system, monitoring processes. But I'm going to repeat uh, a caution that I've heard from Professor Bruno Zumbo at University of British Columbia. Just because we can collect this data, and just because this data might correlate with something we care about, like quality of performance, doesn't mean we have a theory about why this process or sensor data 
is meaningful to learning or teaching. So at this stage, we've got sensors up the yin-yang, and I love it, but where's the theory that says where your eyes go actually means something to what you learn? So we don't have the theory behind the data collection yet. Florence? I, I agree with you, Gavin, but um, I think that um, large language models offer new possibilities now. And I think they can really um, act as intelligent tutors in collaboration with the, the actual human tutor or lecturer. Um, so I think there's going to be great changes in, in the near future. Or we already live in the future somehow. Um, but th there's a great TED talk by uh, Sal Khan from the Khan Academy uh, that was released a, a few days ago. And uh, they developed uh, Khan Migo, who will act as a, an artificial tutor. So that may be where I think AI will help us all. Um, and I think that partially addresses Jane's question as well. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think that's that's something that we're exploring right now. And, uh, you know, as somebody who's very concerned with assessment generally, um, there are situations where dialogic feedback and dialogic processes around assessment are essential. But in large scale, massified higher education, the ability of one instructor or even a tutor to engage with a student in that dialogue can often be very limited. So to me, large language models offer the opportunity to have students engage in at least initial dialogues, albeit with an artificial intelligence, that may advance them a little further in situations where the workload makes it prohibitive for them to have that dialogue with a human being, which sounds a bit dystopian, but that's where we are right now with higher education. And so sometimes we have to accept, uh, you know, we compensate. And I think, you know, if we value dialogic processes and improvement in e-portfolios, that could be a very important role for AI. We only have a couple min minutes left. Um, so probably only time for another question. I'm just going to draw your attention to the Q&A question. Um, Daniel um, has asked an excellent question here in regards to a lot of this seems to be that the greatest positive effect is for students who are highly intelligent um, to or perhaps highly self-regulated, perhaps, right? Um, but low on the traits such as consciousness and organization, which again speaks, I think, a little bit to um, the self-regulated learning strategies that students um, would require to be effectively um, successful in developing their e-portfolio and their reflective practice and their metacognition awareness, which is all required for it. So how about the research in relation to those who perhaps don't have these self-regulated learning strategies or such traits? Is there any research that talks about how the less performing students, perhaps, um, what they get out of in terms of using e-portfolios or how we can better support them in the process? Right. So um, just a, a, as a preview, this is exactly one of the questions that Gavin and Florence and I are beginning to get into uh, with some research that we're trying to advance. When you look at the research on e-portfolios around this very issue, what you see is there is a failure to communicate around uh, the chicken or the egg. In other words, when we do see improved relation between self-regulated learning and e-portfolios, is it because we're starting with self-regulated learners who are engaging with the e-portfolios and advancing more quickly? Or is it that we are seeing highly adroit e-portfolio systems take people who are not necessarily very good uh, self-regulated learners, but are advanced in those characteristics through engagement with a system? We don't know the answer. And because we don't know the answer, and it's pretty important, we should know the answer. So we're going to try and find that out. And, of course, it also depends. When you use the word conscientiousness, that sounds like personality theory, which may be irrelevant. We don't really care what your personality is. This is the task. You have to perform it to get the reward at the end. So I don't care if you're what your personality is. Just do the work. Yeah, but if we swap it out for motivation, okay. right, which are not identical, but let's yeah. let's do the swap and say, you know, motivation matters and motivation yeah. does regress to a degree on personality. And so if we see those as, as somewhat related, 
um, then yeah, it becomes a really big issue. It's, are we gaining success because we're speaking to those who are motivated or are we motivating those who need to be spoken to? Yeah. And if we don't have the answer to that, we absolutely need to, and not just around e-portfolios. Yes. And for me, motivation comes from competence, not the other way around. So let's help them become competent at the skills needed to use the technology, to do the assessment, to actually reflect on, and so on. They need to be taught. People don't just acquire that unless they're highly able already and can do it before we even start. All right. I'm going to have to draw this fascinating debate to a close. Um, on the note of um, Chris and Gavin and Florence planning to pursue their research, hopefully they can come back, do another webinar once that research has been conducted and share their findings with, um, with all of us. So thank you very much for the time you've taken out of your very busy schedules, um, Chris, Gavin, and Florence, for talking to us about ePortfolios, the challenges of the um, the prospects of the future with them, and um, certainly raising our awareness of the much needed research that's required in this field. So thank you. Well, thank, thank you, you Megan, and all our participants. Yes, today. thanks to everyone for joining us too. Thank you. Enjoy your day, everyone. Thanks again.